Justice John Paul Stevens, Justice David Souter, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I dissent. Four, the consequences. Race-related controversy, as school districts and others seek to unravel the meaning of today's several opinions. Delay, setback in bringing about racially diverse schools, trying to deal with threats of de facto segregation, trying to unify education in communities divided by poverty correlated with race. These consequences are serious. The conclusion of all this is simple. Yesterday, the plans under review were lawful. Today, they are not. Yesterday, the citizens of this nation could look for guidance to this Court's unanimous pronouncements concerning desegregation. Today, they cannot. Yesterday, school boards had available to them a full range of means to combat schools that are segregated in fact. Today, they do not. And there is more. What has happened to starry decisis? The history of the plans before us, their educational importance, their highly limited use of race, all these and more make clear that it, the compelling interest here is stronger than in, for example, Grutter, where we upheld the race-conscious uh, law school admissions program. They're more narrowly tailored. And what has happened to all those cases that made very clear that in the context of a K through 12 public schools, this kind of program is constitutionally permissible? What's happened to Swan and others, McDaniel, Crawford, Harris, School Committee of Boston, Seattle School District Number 1? The plurality's logic writes these cases out of the law. It is not often in the law that so few have so quickly change so much. What of the hope and promise of Brown? <coughs> For much of this nation's history, the races remained divided. It wasn't that long ago that people of different races drank from separate fountains, rode on separate buses, studied in separate schools. In this Court's finest hour, Brown versus Board of Education challenged that history and helped to change it. For Brown held out a promise. It was a promise embodied in three amendments designed to make citizens of former slaves. It was a promise of true racial equality, not as a matter of fine words on paper, but as a matter of everyday life of the nation's citizens and schools. It was about the nature of democracy that must work for all Americans. It sought one law, one nation, one people, not simply as a matter of legal principle, but in terms of how we actually live our lives. Not everyone welcomed that decision. Three years after it, the governor of Arkansas ordered state militia to block the doors of a white schoolhouse so that black school children could not enter. The president of the United States dispatched the 101st Airborne to Little Rock and federal troops were needed to enforce that desegregation decree. Today, almost 50 years later, attitudes towards race in this nation have changed dramatically. No airborne division. Many parents, white and black alike, maybe almost all, I hope, want their children to attend schools with children of different races. Indeed, the very school districts that once spurned integration now strive for it. The long history of their efforts reveals the complexity and difficulties they face. And in light of those challenges, they here ask us not to take from their hands the instruments that they have used to rid their schools of racial segregation, instruments that they believe are still necessary to overcome the problems of cities that are divided by race and poverty. Plurality would decline their modest request. The plurality is wrong to do that. 
last half century has witnessed great strides towards racial equality. We have not yet realized the promise of Brown. To invalidate the plans under review here is to threaten the promise of Brown. The plurality's position, not intended, but I fear, would break that promise. This is a decision that the Court and the nation will come to regret. I must dissent. Justice Breyer is a well-respected and very influential thinker in intellectual property, uh, dating back to his days as a professor at Harvard Law School, where he wrote in 1970 a very famous article called The Uneasy Case for Copyright uh, in the Harvard Law Review. Uh, in that article, Justice Breyer was well ahead of his time uh, in that he was able to use both economic analysis of the law as well as empirical analysis of the book industry to make his case that some of the proposed expansions of copyright in the 1976 Act uh, were not warranted. Uh, on the Supreme Court, Justice Breyer has been able to use uh, those skills uh, in a number of his opinions, uh, perhaps most famously in his powerful dissent in the Elder case, in which he dissented from the majority's view that the Copyright Term Extension Act, which added 20 more years to all copyrights, was constitutional. Uh, Justice Breyer, using economic analysis, was able to uh, show or argue that the effect of that law was virtually the same as a perpetual copyright. Uh, similarly, Justice Breyer uh, used economic analysis in his concurrence in, in the Grokster decision, in which he was able to use industry data as well as economic analysis to uh, show how new technologies should be analyzed under the court's Sony Safe Harbor, uh, looking for substantial non-infringing uses of new technologies. Now, in other areas of intellectual property, Justice Breyer has also had great influence. Uh, perhaps his most influential decision in the patent realm is the Dickinson case, in which uh, Justice Breyer, using his administrative law expertise, uh, wrote for the uh, court uh, that the patent office uh, is an administrative agency subject to the Administrative Procedures Act and its uh, standards of review. Uh, even when Justice Breyer is not writing an opinion for the court, he's also had a great influence. So, for instance, in his dissent to the denial of certiorari in Metabolite, uh, Justice Breyer's powerful dissent actually foreshadowed much of the recent reexamination of grants of patents in the biotechnology and medical fields uh, that have been questioned uh, that they, they may be based merely on principles of nature or natural phenomenon. Now, outside of uh, patents and in the realm of trademarks, uh, perhaps the most influential decision of uh, Justice Breyer in intellectual property has been the Qualitex decision, in which he wrote for the court an opinion that upheld, um, excuse me, that uh, recognized that colors can be trademarked. And that opinion has been influential in uh, subsequent uh, trademark cases in a, taking a very broad approach to uh, trademark subject matter to so-called non-traditional uh, marks, including uh, sound, smell, taste, uh, and motion. In this case, uh, Qualitex is a company that makes press pads for dry cleaning uh, services, and they colored them a special green gold and people began to associate the green gold with the Qualitex company, and they trademarked that color. Somebody else began to imitate the pads, the, uh, the uh, defendant, and then Qualitex sued them for trademark infringement. The Ninth Circuit held that a color, pure and simple, cannot be a trademark. And that was the issue that we had to decide. We've decided that a color, pure and simple, can sometimes be a trademark. Our reason, basically, is we looked at the statute, and it says that a trademark can include any word, name, symbol, or device, and that seems to mean almost anything. Also, it's true that in the past, shapes and sounds like the NBC chimes and even a smell has sometimes been a trademark. It fits within the rest of the definition, that is, it can pick out and distinguish a product and put in people's minds the fact that that product is associated with a particular company, 
and so it can serve the purpose of trademark law. And also, at some point, sometimes, the color wouldn't necessarily serve a function. Because if it serves a function other than just identifying the company, it can't be a trademark. So it seems to qualify. Now, the Ninth Circuit thought there were special reasons involving colors that would prevent them from being trademarks, such as they'd be hard to distinguish one from the other. But lots of things are hard to distinguish one from the other. They thought there were a limited supply of colors, but actually there are many. And the doctrine of functionality makes certain that colors can still be used to make things beautiful or serve other functions, and trademark law won't tie them up. And we looked into the history of the statute and thought in historical terms, too, it's meant to uh, apply to colors. And for that reason, we've reversed the Ninth Circuit, and our opinion is unanimous. So one of the privileges of clerking for Justice Breyer when I did, one of the many privileges, is that I clerked for him during his third term on the bench of the Supreme Court. And at that time, he was thinking quite deliberately and self-consciously about being a justice and what it meant to be a justice. And it's, he likes to think by talking. So it's a real pleasure now to read books like uh, Acts of Liberty and um, Making Our Democracy Work and, and see how he has, the ideas that he talked about back then have evolved and become um, much more, uh, have become increasingly substantial. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say about them today. Yes. And it's how they're used in ordinary English. So let me give you an example, even odder than Justice Alito's. But it, I think it illustrates the point, the question. Imagine you put your son in his room, and they say, why did you keep your son in his room doing his homework? Because I wanted to prevent him from going to the movies. That's why. Now, when you say that, we would impute, correctly, you wanted to prevent him from going to a Hollywood movie. You wanted to prevent him from going to an old movie, prevent him from going to a new movie, but prevent him from going to a Lithuanian movie? Now, why does that sound so odd? Because there's no realistic possibility that he would go to a Lithuanian movie. Okay? Now, if that's the problem, if that's the problem, the words that capture that problem are their words. Realistic likelihood not the words possibility. So if I have to choose between those two, and that is the problem, why don't I choose their solution? Well, I guess in our view, it's less important <coughs> which words you pick All right, than it is what they mean. And so if by realistic possibility, if realistic probability or realistic Did they use a realistic, realistic likelihood? And if someone were to tell me in my odd example, <coughs> there is no realistic likelihood he would go to a Lithuanian movie. That seems to describe perfectly whether I would or would not say, in trying to prevent him from going to the movies, you try to prevent him from going to a Lithuanian movie. And, your, and yours doesn't quite, I mean, it's a, I agree, that may not make that much difference, but we have to choose some form of words. Well, I understand this. You mean it would have been okay if he went to a Lithuanian movie? <laughs> No, it wouldn't have been okay, but.